Thank you, uh, Dr. Cornelius, for the honor of being invited, which I accepted with joy. It's been interesting for me, being here, to, in listening to conversations in Romanian and singing songs, to notice the common roots that we have in Latin between French and Romanian. I realize there are a lot of differences also. But uh, for those of you, of course, who have studied Latin, that may bring up mixed feelings. As you know, uh, the famous poem, Latin is a dead language, as you can plainly see. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me. Yeah. <laughs> to extend to you my deepest congratulations for the first steps that have been achieved in this uh, amazing project of a new Christian university in Romania. I'm sure that the words, <clears throat> who would have thought, even 20 years ago, perhaps even 10 years ago, uh, that such an accomplishment would be possible are, if these words are on our minds today. And we thank God um, for that. However, my presentation today is a word of caution. I am not trying to throw cold water on your passion for a new Christian university. Please believe that. Because it is pre precisely in times of passionate commitment that we may fall inadvertently into different snares. Thus, I wish to share with you today some precautionary and hopefully practical thoughts for your consideration. I state my thesis as follows. Properly conceived and structured, evangelical Christian universities can be instruments of great value as we pre prepare Christian leaders for both church and society in our context. Evangelical universities have long been present in the, in the English-speaking world, particularly in North America, and there is much to be learned, both positively and negatively, from that experience. As we observe the growing trend of the foundation of new evangelical universities around the world, it is my contention that there are serious pitfalls to avoid and strong protections to be put into place. Thus, the goal of my presentation this morning is the preservation and the fostering of the missional and ecclesial calling of both the Christian University and of the Theological Seminary, which is linked to it. And of course, to learn from the past. As the philosopher George Santayana has said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I would like to briefly this morning identify two major challenges and thirdly propose some practical thoughts for meeting those two challenges. The first challenge is protecting the Christian university from creeping secularization. Protecting the Christian university from creeping secularization. In his landmark work, The Soul of the American University, from Protestant establishment to established non-belief, George Marston describes the process of secularization of the Christian University in the North American context in three stages. First, I quote, making education non-sectarian by identifying with general, generic Christianity. Then, by an appeal to spiritual and moral ideals of a vaguely religious or patriotic caste. And finally, by exclusion of specifically Christian religious values and practices in the name of allegedly universal intellectual, moral, 
and democratic qualities. Robert Benning has pointed out that there are three distinctive components of a Christian university that may be at risk. Its vision, its ethos, and the Christian persons who bear that vision and ethos. To paraphrase Benny relative to the Christian university, we must proactively protect our distinctively evangelical Christian mission, our distinctively evangelical Christian culture, and the Christian commitment of those responsible for our institution. This is not, however, please believe me, a call to build a fortress, to retreat from the world, or to develop an obscurantist mentality. On the contrary. It, but it is a call to transgenerational vigilance. Transgenerational vigilance. The danger of which I am speaking here is also known as mission drift. Indeed, Christian universities, like all human organizations, are vulnerable to this phenomenon, described as the state of a human organization that has gradually and inadvertently moved away from its original mission. This is somehow akin, for those of you who are scientific here, uh, to the physical law of entropy or decay. As the default tendency over time will be to drift away from our roots unless safeguards are put in place at the outset. Benny has called this a failure of vision, at least of theological vision, that has proceeded from a living religious tradition. But a second major concern, protecting the theological seminary within the university. Our common friend, Dr. Manfred Cole, has captured well the essence of this concern when he states, at the outset, let me say that I am very much in favor of Christian universities. We should have them everywhere. What I am against is to have them piggybacked onto a well-established theological seminary. History has shown numerous times that the seminary gets swallowed up and loses its biblical theological focus no later than the second generation of board members and faculties. While I might nuance what Dr. Cole has to say, I think his warning is well taken. For the issue is not the legitimacy of the Christian university, but rather its interface with the theological school. Is there an alternative to the amalgamation about which Manfred Cole warns us? What would be the proper relationship between the theological seminary and the new Christian university, which would allow each to be distinct, but complement and bring synergy to one another? And why is this important? How might creeping secularization and mission drift be prevented in the context of your university project. It is the people of the university who make the difference. As the mission and the culture of the institution flow from the thought and work of its stakeholders, again, Benet states, absent a critical mass of persons who could bear the ethos of a specific tradition, whatever religious identity the school had, quickly subsided. This is the testimony of history. He defines this notion of critical mass. I'd like for you to retain that expression. Critical mass as an adequate number of persons, board, administrators, faculty, and students, with a firm understanding of and commitment to the vision and ethos of each school sponsoring heritage, available at the necessary times to translate that heritage into the school's life in a persuasive manner. Enough committed and competent persons present at crucial times to ensure, to insist, 
that the sponsoring heritage be publicly and fittingly relevant in all facets of college life. In developing this notion of critical mass, he feels that a workable critical mass for the Christian university could be constituted roughly of three circles of one-third each. I think we can discuss the math, but the idea is, is interesting. He says that one-third, including intensely committed persons possessing solid understanding of the school's vision, mission, and values, critical center core, one-third who warmly support the school, but with less commitment and understanding. One-third who give approval to the school, but who are not interested in making space for Christianity in higher education. It is, of course, when that latter third becomes more numerous and takes precedence that the Christian university comes into risk. It is the combination of the first two circles, committed and understanding people <coughs> relative to the school's mission, vision, and values, and those who have less commitment and understanding but are necessarily, are, are yet committed to the school. Those two-thirds, in Benny's opinion, constitute the critical mass that the university needs over time to preserve its Christian mission, vision, and values. If the university begins to lose this critical mass of commitment, the theological seminary linked to it will help to be affected. If the seminary resists the trend toward dilution of the Christian commitment of the university, the latter may use financial, political, or other leverage to achieve its ends. Whereas, for example, the income generating capacity of the university far superior to that of the seminary, could be considered as an advantage for the fi financial viability of the seminary, the university budget could also become an instrument of control on the seminary, on the part of those defending uh, various forms of secularization of the university. I recall that we in Lebanon had, and, and, and still have on at least on the drawing board, a university project. <coughs> and the advantages of that project were manifest. A recognition for our students who come from all over the Arab world as they return to their countries and being able to validate their diplomas and their ministries of higher education. Uh, financial advantages of the income producing nature of a university compared to the income sucking nature, generally speaking, of a theological seminary. Uh, theological seminaries are costly, and theological students generally do not have a lot of income, <coughs> nor do the alumni of theological schools generally have much income to contribute to the university. They have other things to contribute. Such things, as I have mentioned, generally do not happen during the first generation of the life of the new university but tend to emerge with subsequent generations. And it's this longer view which I would like to propose to you this morning. In order to envision preventive measure to this state of affairs, to these two uh, dangers, these two risks of secularization of the university and mission drift of the theological seminary, I would like to identify five stakeholder groups that are crucial to protecting the mission of the Christian University and the theological seminary related to it. This will be my third and final of the, of the five groups, the first are the stakeholders. These are the people ultimately responsible to protect the mission of the Christian University. And in the case of a denominationally related university such as yours, it is the church constituency that constitutes the primary stakeholders. This, it is the church constituency which will be the primary group served 
by the institution of higher learning. Of course, society in general will be served. But the first group of stakeholders, the principal group of stakeholders, will be the church constituency. It has often been said, as the seminary goes, so goes the church. You've heard that, perhaps. Conversely, it could be affirmed that the seminary and the Christian university may be a reflection of the degree of health of the churches. So therefore, it goes both ways. The church can and must exercise its responsibility to influence the academy in behalf of the preservation of its mission, culture, and faithfulness to that mission and culture. When the church relinquishes its responsibility over the university and the theological school by allowing the links of accountability to be weakened or even cut, pervasive mission drift will likely take place in both the university and the center. In addition to being aware of this danger, constituent stakeholders should take proper steps to ensure that the university policy integrates the necessary protections on the various levels of board, administration, faculty, and students. Please understand me properly here. I am not calling here for setting up a climate of suspicion or constant surveillance in which the constituency is constantly looking over the shoulder of the university leadership in the accomplishment of its task in search of some negative tendency that might take place. That can be a danger. But I am reminding the church constituency of its responsibility to be vigilant and to find ways to remain connected <coughs> to the university and the center. <coughs> this vital link works both ways, from church to university and seminary, and from university and seminary to the church. But the second group uh, is that of what I would call governance. <coughs> the second key entity, and equally important for the protection of the Christian university and the theological seminary, is governance as it relates in particular to the work of the board for the boards. <clears throat> we know from experience that so often governance, board governance, is either the Achilles heel or the strong backbone of an institution. This is true in all Christian organizations, true in organizations in general. Boards may fall into one of two extremes, either micromanagement or on the other extreme, rubber stamping of the school's executive leadership. Both of these extremes put the institution at risk. Such boards sacrifice their calling as a vital link between the stakeholders and the fulfillment of institutional mission. When boards micromanage, that is, they intervene in arenas that are the responsibility of the university management, they lose the critical, committed distance that is unique to them and everyone will suffer. Whenever overly compliant boards simply rubber stamp the decisions of strong executive leadership, they cause university management to lose true accountability. So often it is in this case that institutions lose their way, conflicts emerge, and a pathway of institutional decay begins. Such considerations highlight the need for appropriate board members, appropriate selection of board members. Whenever schools begin to neglect the naming of committed Christians to the board, the mission, culture, and culture and people of the university may begin to drift away from its roots to the detriment of all. In, the, in addition, it is foundational to include proper training of board members in the accomplishment of their tasks. It is often taken for granted that board members selected will be able to fulfill their roles by their very stature, professional qualifications, or connections to the stakeholders. Living 15 years in the Middle East, I realized, and 
and this is the analysis of Arab leaders as well, that we do not have a culture of board governance in the Middle East. The Middle East is governed principally by a semi-tribal culture in which the head of the institution, the head of the board, has a certain tribal headship responsibility. But the idea of accountability and, and uh, uh, board governance is not something that is uh, primarily uh, instinctive in the culture. And on the other hand, it's not something that we can bring in from the West taking such as a Carver model of board governance and just trying to apply it to a Middle Eastern culture. It's pretty simply, it does not work. So Arab leaders are reflecting on a middle way which would bring in the various principles of governance that we understand as more or less universal and apply them to the cultural, religious, and specific context of the Arab world. Quite a challenge. I must say, but it is being taken up. <clears throat> Training is very, very important because board members need to understand their task as key to protecting the mission, values, and people of a Christian university and preventing the dangers of over-involved micromanagement or laissez-faire rubber stamping of the university leadership. We often use the word fiduciary to describe the role of good boards, which comes from the Latin fides, Latin again, related to the idea of faithfulness in what has been entrusted. And in addition to Christian commitment, a good board will be characterized by a constellation of professions among its members. Whenever a nonprofit board is top heavy with one professional category, whether it be pastors, educators, business people, lawyers, etc., the mission and work of the university will ultimately suffer. It is precisely the variety of competencies and gifts that will bring needed collective wisdom to the vital decisions uh, taken by the board, whether in their roles as linked to the constituency, in their function of forging university policy, or in their task of providing accountability to university management. The third group key group is executive leadership. And this may seem so obvious. After the stakeholders and the board, the administration management of the university is key. Once again, I quote Pene, the president is crucial in setting the overall direction of the school. He or she must believe that the Christian account of life and reality is publicly relevant to all facets of school, the school's life and understand and embody the sponsoring tradition. Without a compelling vision from those entrusted with leadership, schools quickly lose their cohesion or momentum. We might apply also such considerations to the key lieutenants of the president, whether they be the provost, dean of academic affairs, dean of students, principal leader of administration finance, as these key persons are often involved in some way in the hiring of faculty, which I will speak of in a moment. Policy concerning the hiring of the key people in the university and in the theological seminary, of course, must be put in place by the board in accordance with the mission of the university. We can also speak here of the influence of department chairs who have prerogatives and influence, as well as the role of the administrative staff whose work and perspective is fundamental to the realization of daily work of the institution and who have significant influence on the students. I recall uh, during my responsibilities in France, uh, we did an annual evaluation exercise in our school uh, of the students. So each student had an opportunity to hear how he, was, he or she was perceived by the faculty, by the staff of, of the institution to be able to dialogue and use this as a growing experience. It was not a punishment. It was a, a, a positive, evaluative experience to help the students see how they might improve and also to be, give feedback to the school on how they might improve their service. And one of the best decisions that we made at that particular time was to bring in, in that evaluation team, along with one or two professors, the academic dean 
the president of the school, but also the head of administrative and financial affairs for the school. Because he, who is responsible for the practical work of the students, for the overall running of the institution, saw the students differently than we did as faculty members. And that combination of viewpoints was very, very useful, both to the student as well as to the, to the school. Faculty is the fourth group. This is the most vital and visible group of all, the teaching faculty of the university and the seminary. The faculty has been historically a crucial entry point for the secularization of the Christian university and the drifting of the mission of the theological center. The addition of faculties, departments, or disciplines necessarily puts pressure on the university and seminary community to find qualified faculty for those teaching areas. The limited number of qualified evangelical Christians, critical mass, may lead to the appointment into key faculty positions of men and women who are not committed believers. Another factor deserving mention relative to faculty as well as to the institution in general is process and procedures and pressures of accreditation particularly as it relates to governmental or paragovernmental recognition, which may, more or less subtly, subtly, lead the institution away from its mission. This particularly becomes the case when the primary motivational factors, conscious or subconscious, become that of respectability and recognition, rather than a quest for Christian excellence in fulfilling ecclesial and missional calling. I can't resist putting in a little publicity here. As former chair of the European Evangelical Accrediting Association, along with my colleagues, we often <coughs> had to plead the case for evangelical quality assurance, uh, whereas schools were so often attracted to the secular accreditation with its prestige and recognition before society, tending then to to deconsider or to marginalize the thought of evangelical quality assurance. But we must remember that no secular quality assurance or quality development agency will tend to the needs of evangelical faithfulness, spiritual formation, ministry competency in the way that our evangelical agencies can. We are not calling for the disregard of governmental norms. That would be very foolish. However, the secular and evangelical agencies can be very complementary in nature. The one developing norms on behalf of higher education and society, the other in behalf of uh, the church and its leadership needs. The EEAA, European Evangelical Accrediting Association, and other such agencies, it's true, are involved primarily with theological seminaries and not with Christian universities at this point in time. However, there are other global entities that are worthy of the university's consideration. It has been said that nothing of value is accomplished in isolation, including the isolation of the Christian University and Theological Seminary from the community of European Evangelical Higher Education. And so thus I would exhort you and encourage you uh, to the extent that it's not yet the case, to uh, have partnerships, to have connections with others who are doing the same kind of work that you are doing. Because the university is a school, it becomes obvious that the faculty is the heart of the institution, both the university and the seminary. Vinny, once again, him, states, faculty selection is both the most important and the most difficult of tasks. It is most important because faculty members are the ground troops, the ones who will directly encounter the students. Faculty members will not only have to be adept to teaching, scholarship, and service, but also at a fourth category, institutional fit. Ability to contribute to the identity and the mission of the Christian college is as important a criterion as the traditional three. The importance of the faculty cannot be overstated. Robert Ferris, former dean of Columbia International University, once stated, the faculty is the curriculum. 
faculty embody, model, and transmit their values and experience. Last but certainly not least, and I address my <coughs> majority of those who are present in this room, the students constitute a vital component of a truly Christian university. Without students, we have no school. You are absolutely fundamental. Someone said to me one time, the best students come to the schools where they find the best teachers. And I would add, and the best teachers stay in the schools where they work under the best conditions. In North America, where evangelicalism has been traditionally strong, the critical mass of students accepted in the Christian universities has been predominantly evangelical and connected to churches. Such a critical mass, however, may not be in place in other locations where a Christian university is created. Indeed, developing a Christian university in a country where evangelicalism is a minority is a very different challenge. When you think of North America as being, the United States in particular, as being probably 20 to 25 percent evangelical, it's a very different situation in France where it's 1 percent. I don't know in Romania what the percentage might be. Evangelical? 1 to 1 to 1 percent. About 5 percent. So you have a stronger critical mass. Uh, here in Romania than we would in France. Lower population. <laughs> True. <laughs> However, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to recognize that this is a very different challenge that you have than a culture where evangelicalism is so strong and has a, a critical mass of students that come from evangelical background. In order to ensure that, enough, that the numbers of students' income and other metrics are in place in such an environment, a university may be compelled to admit a significant number of students who do not come from the religious tradition of the church or the constituent church or churches. In this situation, the minority situation of evangelicalism in the country may not give the proper weight for preserving the Christian mission, culture, and actors of the university. As we look among these five crucial groups, stakeholders, board administration, board administration, faculty, and students, we might be tempted to identify the crux of the problem in terms of quantity, or as many phrased it, not enough committed and competent persons were present at crucial times to insist that the sponsoring heritage be publicly and fittingly relevant in all facets of college life. The critical mass of committed people is key to the future, transgenerationally speaking, of the Christian university. Perhaps in a non-North American context, in a context like Romania, or like France, or like other contexts where Christian universities are growing up around the world, the question should be stated otherwise. Despite the lack of critical mass for the evangelical community in our country, how can we develop a Christian university and theological faculty that will remain truly Christian over time? Despite the lack of critical mass for the evangelical community in our country, how can we develop a Christian university and theological faculty that will remain truly Christian over time? I cannot pretend to answer this question in your place. I'd rather leave it with you while, understand, while underlining the absolutely crucial nature of this issue. I encourage you to reflect theologically and practically upon it at this early stage, as you are doing in this present symposium, uh, for which I am very grateful. Uh, for if not taken seriously in the early years, there may be a long and difficult road back in the future. I would recommend that a task force of historians, philosophers, educationalists, and theologians within the university and with representation from the board be appointed to interact with the literature that has emerged from North America and elsewhere on this subject, while of course doing the necessary contextualization 
for the situation and the particular history that is yours in Romania today. It is noteworthy in passing that the issue of creeping secularization and mission drift are not solely Protestant challenges, but ones that Catholic and even Orthodox higher education must also confront. <laughs> Conclusion. Stated positively, the challenge is to preserve and foster truly evangelical Christian values in the Christian university. Joel Carpenter exhorts all newer Christian universities to protect their values. I quote, if there is one message that one would hope to leave with our creative and intrepid new colleagues of Christian higher education, did you know that you were creative and intrepid? It is this, that the very structures of what we do academically have Christian values driving them. On one hand, schools are necessarily preoccupied with the, map, with the market. Student census is a key factor in financial viability, but also in matters of reputation, development, prestige, etc. In today's market-driven models of higher education, witness the Bologna process, the temptation can be strong in a Christian university to sacrifice the Christian vision of peace, justice, and the full flourishing of people and place. Carpenter encourages leadership of the new Christian universities to seriously consider the following questions. What is it that makes higher education Christian? How do Christian universities advance the gospel's transformation of culture? With all the pressures that exist in the world today to reduce, commodify, and instrumentalize higher education, how can we place much hope for new flowerings of Christian thought within fragile and vulnerable new Christian universities. It is highly satisfying to me to see that the present symposium addresses a number of these issues from a wide variety of perspectives. As you have sensed, my major concern as a theological educator is to protect the mission of the theological seminary that finds itself in relationship with the Christian university, which I would consider as the soul of the Christian University. This concern, therefore, is not only vital for the seminary, but also for the ethos of the Christian University as a whole. Indeed, as you protect, preserve, and encourage the evangelical Christian mission of the theological seminary in the university, you will also nurture and defend the university in its Christian tradition. And as Christian educators, we believe that God will bless the protection of those priorities. I trust that this presentation will be not, not be taken as a discouragement to you in your project, but rather constitute a plea for clear-eyed consideration of these realities taken from history. And I conclude by offering these words of Joel Carpenter as an encouragement to you. We should not give up the broader vision of a Christian university. Great things can happen in a comprehensive Christian institution of higher learning that is devoted, as origin of Alexandria put it, to bringing every trend of existing philosophy and science into Christian service. Once again, as I look at the program of the symposium, I can see the topics themselves show that you are taking these challenges seriously. May God give you grace and wisdom as you do so. Thank you.